after page 20. <laughs> well, like, it's so amazing that they're, they're, they're basically doing like a new visa platform so they're, they're destroying visa it's it looks incredible if they can pull it off those investors are uh, they're going to be laughing in the bahamas soon so. well they raised a lot of money for it so they better deliver yeah yeah for real for real yeah 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 i agree uh what do you think is more complicated opening an exchange or a nice sto <laughs> exchange <laughs> <STR. Question. laughs> exchange, yeah. I, I, I think exchange. What do you think, Steve? I think it, I think, okay. well, I mean, cool, I right. think an exchange uh, isn't that hard because you can just go and buy an out of the box one and just put it up live. It's not hard to do. I yeah. mean, there's like four or five software packages well, out there. The security you, as well behind it, the firewall. Yeah, of course. There's, the, if you're talking about costs, I'd rather put my money into hiring a bunch of security experts and building a proper system because I've come from a background that. You're, yeah. you're asking me what I'm more comfortable with. What I'm more comfortable with is building software because that's where I spent my career. If you're asking no, me to spend my money on okay. lawyers, uh, I'm not comfortable spending it on lawyers because I don't know how to control their spending because you give them a task and they won't fix cost anything. I spent my entire life in the career of uh, IT consulting where we fixed price, we limited the hours, we delivered the work. If the work took more time than what we thought it would take, it was on us. And in the legal profession, it's the other way around. They won't fix price things. They just keep on billing hours. You say, look, I've only got a budget for this. And they keep going. And it's so hard to control. I would not want to be in a place where I'm having to spend money on something that I don't feel comfortable with. So for me, building software is easier because I know what I'm de dealing with. And I know how to go and say, hey, company A, B, and C, give me a quote for this. And I'll write the spec out and say, this is what I want you to give me. Can you do it? I'll take the three quotes, I'll take the price that's in the middle or the team that seems to be the best and then I'll bring in a secondary team that checks the security of everything, job done, price, I don't know, 100K, 200K and I've got my exchange built. See what I mean? So for me, it's you not know, comfort, a comfort factor for me more than anything. Also, I think I thought of your question a little bit different. Can SDOs and ICOs coexist though? Sure, of course they can. You can do dual token uh, no. in, a, in a project, absolutely, because the security token is being used for the purposes of um, securing the assets. The, the utility token can be used to operate the platform. The question is whether you can do d dual fundraising of the two at the same time. Um, theoretically, you can if you do the STO in certain restricted countries and you do the ICO in other countries where they're less restricted and they're just doing, but you don't mix the two together. You have to keep them absolutely separate. Right. But I don't think yeah, there's any yeah. specific rules that define whether this is okay or not. I think some people would say, shame on you, Steve, for saying this. And other people would say, it's fine. But I don't, I've not seen anybody say it's absolutely not okay. I have worked with projects that are do, using dual token. Um, the utility token is being used for things that are pure utility to run and operate the platform because the security token is typically being used to pay people something like a dividend or some monthly returns or something like that. It's not the, the security tokens that I've seen so far aren't being used in any utility way. So the yeah. project still, if it's a blockchain project, still needs a utility token. If the project is yeah. not a blockchain project that's just going down the STO path, they don't need a utility token. So that's that's another really interesting fork in the road as you, I suppose, for crypto purposes. <laughs> we're, we're, having, we're forking our own STO. What's that? The beast? I've seen the company use free tokens, so like utility yeah. security and private token. Real, so like okay. Investment token, like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you 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 could definitely do that. I mean, you could have a security token that's for dividends, another one that's for for profits, and another no. token that would be a utility token used for powering the platform. So that's right. That's exactly what it was. Because if you have yeah. transaction fees and service fees or costs for running the platform or delivery costs or whatever or you know, voting for things and rewarding people, that kind of stuff. You're not going to give them security tokens for that. You're presumably going to give them utility tokens. So, so yes, there's absolutely space for both, 100%. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like now, an interesting... Go on, you go sorry, on, sorry, you sorry. Go on. Right, uh, yeah, I was just going to say there's an interesting question, actually. I think the answer is no, but let's see what uh, you guys say. So, will my funds be safe? Once they're on exchange, or are they exposed to the same market volatility? Uh, to be honest, I don't think that makes a difference because I mean, once it's on an exchange, 
is tradable, right? I think or what, will it be tradable in a restricted fashion? Because we, maybe I think this is where this person tried to get to. It's a good question. And the answer is we don't really know because we don't have any security token exchanges out there. And we don't know how the regulators of those countries are actually going to regulate the exchanges. So if you take the one in the US called BACT, which is coming out sometime you know, in the next two months, yeah. Uh, which will be rather interesting because I don't know of any STOs that have really finished their project. So I'm not sure what the benefit will be to have the exchange out now. But I'm going to mention one after you finish. Good. Yeah, I'd like to know about that. But the, the thing is, um, there will probably be some sort of restrictions. I would imagine, for example, if a coin moves up and down a certain percentage, they might um, lock trading on it. Kind of the way like in the stock markets, if you have like flash crashes, you know, if it drops a certain amount within a certain period of time, uh, and CryptoBeast, you'll know about this as a former trader, right? That when you get these kind of hotbeds of really like drops, they'll just close the market and they do a cooling off period. Sometimes it's for 15 minutes, sometimes it's for an hour, and then they'll open up the market. If the market drops again, they stop the market again. They're like triggers. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they could potentially do exactly the same thing with coins that pumps and dumps would both be restricted to 5% rise, 10% rise. I mean. You don't see that in the stock market and there's days where Tesla is up or down a lot and no one's, you know, you could argue it's pump or dump, but I guess because the amount of money in it is so much bigger than what we're used to in the crypto space that it might just be that we're not certain of how it plays out. So honest answer, no idea how they'll restrict this. I don't, I really don't know. And it's theoretically possible to still have the pump and dump in the early days. Um, because if you compare this to, let's say, pink sheets or penny stocks, you could have the same problem there too. So yeah, yeah. I really don't, I really don't know how it's going to play out. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Actually, Nash, I don't know if you've heard about them. Uh, they used to be called Neon Exchange, but they recently rebranded. They've got they've, there's a I'm lot of hype around them. ICO. Did you did you get the lottery? Did you invest? Yeah, in? I won the lottery. Nice, um, nice. I won, nice. I won so the 10k one, so I was I'm putting in that money because. It's a really great project, in my opinion. Yeah, it was restricted to 1K, I believe, wasn't it? In the long no, run. it was 1K and then 10K uh, for like extra winners with KYC. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, so I got pretty lucky there. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was only like 25K people who won. Yeah. Well, it was $1 at the ICO price, and now it's gone to like 95 cents on uh, on an exchange, which I'm going to be talking about after. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, I'm guessing you guys are probably familiar with this exchange. But uh, yeah, so for the next question, are exchanges allowed to list security tokens or do they need a special license? And here if we're, we're talking about block trade, which is a centralized exchange that apparently can list them. So I'm guessing that they've got a license, like Steve was saying, based on the country that they're in. And also you've got DEXs like Affiliate, which is a decentralized exchange, you know, it's a DEX, but not really decentralized because it's kind of like hybrid from what we've heard. Uh, and apparently they've listed next, right? So you can actually buy it on there. Uh, if you do KYC and if you're not from the US, if you're from the US, forget it, you can't. Um, they recently had some legal problems there, obviously with the SEC so and all that going on. You know? so, uh, really, what's your opinion on that? My opinion is that they're probably breaking the law because um, m most exchanges are pretty outright saying we do not accept security tokens full stop and they'll try to do minimal checks. Yeah. But in Decentraland, how can you possibly check that? Because it's not really being managed the same way. Maybe the, the teams are checking it. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're monitoring it. Maybe they're not. But I would sincerely doubt that they've actually complied with regulation. Yeah, I think I think they're taking advantage of the fact that uh, I think they're taking advantage of the fact that in the U.S. it's SEC is starting to regulate things, and in the rest of the world, not really, not so much. So they're kind of taking advantage well, of that, right? That Playing the game, true. I guess, yeah. because there are no but, clear rules. I don't know which country they're in, because if you were in Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, Singapore, the UK, I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't be pretty if they were discovered and they were in those countries, because it wouldn't be that much different, because they're it's not legal. Yeah, uh, it's there's so, definitely... so wait, you, you were saying is national I guess it depends where the servers are as well, isn't it? Where they're registered as a company. It's where the company's registered and where the people Sorry, physically... say that again? Yeah, is national an exchange now? Yeah, yeah, on affiliate. And is that their first exchange, the only one they're on? Yeah, yeah. Right? They've actually been listed there for quite some time, even before right. affiliate um shut out US investors. So basically any 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 trader from the US could just 
go in, log in to the affiliate wallet, access their NEP5 tokens, deposit affiliate or a NEO, and then buy with NEO, they could actually buy NEX. NEX is the token, the ticker symbol for, for NASH. So NASH is going to be the exchange, NEX is the token. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All I would say is trade with caution as a trader because there's a yeah. few things to consider. Where the company is formed and the where the individuals who are running the company are residents and yeah. also where they're citizens. And all three of those are factors that could, you know, get them into trouble. So if any of them are Americans, for example, that's going to be a problem. If they're not Americans, but they're operating in the UK and they're all from Russia, but they're in the UK, well, then they're going to be under UK law, even though, you know, even though the company might be formed in Estonia. They have to be yeah. very careful when you're dealing with securities law to make sure you're compliant with where you're from, where you live, and where the company's formed. Yeah. On their website, it actually states that they're in Barcelona. So they would be according to the Spanish law, but apparently their servers are on some small island on the Atlantic. I think St. Kitts, if I'm not mistaken. Amazing. Well, Saint Saint Kitts and Nevis would fall. So I don't know. I mean, Saint would Kitts they have to be registered the where their Commonwealth offices are? Country. They could have offices there as well. Yeah, but Saint Kitts and Nevis yeah. is part of the UK Commonwealth. So guess what? It falls under the jurisdiction of the British Queen, which means it falls under UK common law as well. So they haven't been that clever about it. Okay. Yeah. Right. You know, right. No, I mean, it makes th sense. these are just realities that if you want to get into that space, then just do your homework. And all the things you're describing are now suddenly not just set up a server, it's now a cost. Can I be in this country? Get a lawyer. Can I live in this country? Get a lawyer. Do I have to do this because I'm in this country and I'm from this place and I'm setting this up in this place? These are just going to be compounded costs for all these different factors, which as you know, in an ICO, it's not that necessary. It's, it's just, to me, an ICO is like, I'm a startup. And yeah. there's something between, hi, I'm an ICO, I'm a startup, to, hey, I'm you know, a pseudo-listed company following securities laws, therefore I have to be worried about everything. So that's why I say we need a middle ground here. I, f I find that we're, we've gone from one extreme of hype and, and you know, craziness to the other extreme, which is extreme caution and fear. Yeah, the thing that and really annoyed me is... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say the thing that really annoyed me is the fact that they've said... The CEO has actually declared we're never going to do KYC on any of our customers, any of our traders. You simply log in, start trading on the DEX, and that's it. But they've now implemented the KYC feature. I mean, how safe are your documents with them? What are they going to do with your data if they get shut down, right? Well, are they going to sell it to, to somebody this, for money? They have to do that this is, for Europe. They have to do this to comply with European law. So uh, whether or not they're keeping your data in safe and secure way is an entirely different problem. We don't know how they're so storing it. We don't even know if they're complying with the, the rules around data retention because you could be you know, a user of the system and then stop using it. And actually by law, they're still required to hold the data for usually up to seven years. So I'll bet you most ICOs that shut down don't even realize they still have to hold the data. <laughs> they still have data retention laws they have to comply with, which is normal, but you know, I mean, you know, we're we're in we're in cowboy territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The wild wild west. <laughs> yeah, it is the wild west. Well, nice. Now, for the last question, uh, actually, this is the funny one that I was telling you about. Which secret Telegram group can the investors join for pump and dumps alerts on security tokens? <laughs> I'm not involved, so <laughs> I do. <laughs> Well, as, as I always say on my show, we cannot give any financial advice and anything that we talk about here is only to inform and help people. I like it. Um, and <laughs> if you find one, just drop it down in the description down yeah. in the comments yeah. down below and we'll check it out. And that's all I can say. <laughs> but just, just to, I'm going to put it out there. I did a video about this before. Uh, they're all scams. So just for yeah. people, people getting involved right. in this and looking for pump and dump groups, what you need to realize, it's like a lottery. So one person will benefit, one or two people will benefit. And those two people will tell another two people and people will start believing that everyone benefits. Yeah. Most of you will lose out. Most of you will so put true. your money in and you will you will go down before Listen, you can actually exchange it back. You know, Beast is, a, is an example. Yeah. I, I don't even think they happen that much anymore. No. Uh, yeah, no. They, they use... Do, yeah, I don't think they do. But just for anyone who's thinking, just don't. Just don't I, even. As part of my, you know, journey and learning and discovery, the the dark worlds of crypto, 
I tried to find all the pump and dump projects I could find and just signed up to a bunch of them in Telegram just to monitor them because I wanted to see how they worked. And I think they were probably all run by the same person because they